Hello, everyone. My guest today is Brian de Lottenville. He is the CEO of a company called Benevity, the global leader in CSR and employee engagement software. Brian helps Fortune 1000 clients reinvent corporate giving programs in a way that provides better social and business returns while simultaneously tackling the biggest struggles in the social impact landscape. Brian, are you ready to take us to the top? I will take you as high as I can. How's that? <laughs> hey, that works for me. All right. So for people that don't understand this space, how would you kind of describe the business in a sentence or two? And what is your revenue model? How do you support yourself? So we're uh, probably in, in the intersection of CSR, HR, and brand. So we're, we're trying to help companies engage employees and customers around purpose, meaning, and impact. Uh, our business model is, is uh, we kind of have an API suite, so that's slightly separate, but the bulk of our uh, revenue and business comes from our cloud product, which is an employee giving, volunteering, grants management kind of platform. And uh, so we have professional services, revenue implementation, managed services fees, subscription revenue based on eligible employees, and then a pizza slice uh, transaction processing fee. Okay. And if you look at kind of past, just so we can understand the, the revenue mix, the past 12 months, if we look at your revenue pie is a hundred percent, what percent was just pure SaaS? Uh, 50. Okay. So fairly significant. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay. So with that in mind, um, let, let's break down a use case, uh, kind of a use case a little bit more. So is there a company you can talk about that uses you and specifically, can you, can you kind of share exactly how they use you? Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll, Pick um, maybe the biggest and best program in the world is uh, Microsoft is, okay. is a client of ours. So they um, they use our SaaS product and they call it uh, Microsoft Gives or so something. So it's kind of white labeled um, by different companies. I think the only client that uses it and calls it Benevity is Apple. But um, uh, so they would do their employee. Uh, giving and volunteering um, and, and grant making through our platform and so that they get a single user experience and coherent reporting across um, those different sort of budget cycles. Okay. So it's really like a report. This is what I'm trying to understand though, right? So people are listening going, well, wait, why do they need help with that? So really it's helping identify, giving back opportunities, reporting on what the activities look like. What else? Yeah, so I mean, at its essence, it's it's trying to uh, help uh, companies help people be their best selves and do that through um, a, a democratized, user-centric approach to searching for and giving to charities of choice with or without corporate matching, uh, searching for volunteering opportunities, those sorts of things. Got it. Is that a time thing or a money thing? They're looking to donate, you know, they, at Microsoft, they have to give 20 hours per month or it's a thousand bucks at the end of the year. Or here's how you, you can donate to. It, it, it's time, money, and product. Um, could be skills-based volunteering around board, um, board participation or helping uh, charitable recipients of their product uh, giveaways implement them, those sorts of things. Or just paint, painting a fence. I mean, it, it, it depends on the, the individual. And, and give me a sense. I'm sure you have many different customer cohorts, but just for the sake of time, what, what would the average kind of logo or brand pay you per year to get this kind of tool? Just the SaaS, just the SaaS component. Uh, on average, probably 100,000-ish. Yeah. So does this mean, I mean, at, the reason I ask, at that price point, you really can put an inside sales team behind it. You can afford to put a significant touch on the sale. Yes. I mean, we're, we're, uh, unfortunately, I mean, we're, we're turning away probably 60 plus percent of our inbounds because they're too small for our deployment model. So it is, it is fairly high touch. What's too small for you in terms of team size? Right now it's uh, anything below 500 employees, okay. but, but we tend to focus more on 5,000 and above. Um, yeah. and, Put, put this story kind of on a timeline for me. When did you launch the company? We've been around since 2008. Spent a couple of years building out the back end and the platform, the receiving entities in the various countries, which is a big part of the, uh, the, the moat, if you will, in this space. And then uh, we built the cloud product in 2011. Um, and so we're unfettered by revenue for, for the first uh, few years. But and So how did you support yourself? Did you guys raise early on? Yeah, I will. I've been fortunate. I've had had a a, a couple of uh, 
equities, uh, liquidity events in, in growth companies. And so I, I, I funded each of the angel rounds in the early days, and we avoided institutional money until our metrics were, were pretty compelling. Yeah, that's that's obviously a, a nice place to be there. Help me understand, though. You know, your own personal capital plus investment dollars. Total capital in the company to date is about what? Uh, n- not really. Um, we we have a, a private equity in, investor that now owns the majority of it. And, and oh, okay. When did uh, when did that happen? Uh, well, the first the first firm came in at 2015, a firm called JMI Equity. And last yep. January, uh, General Atlantic uh, came in meaningfully and, and took out most of the original angels and and, uh, and financed a couple of small acquisitions and set us up to sort of realize the potential of this thing. Besides the acquisitions and paying up the early investors, did any of that money go to the balance sheet or was all really secondary? No, there was some treasury as well. Oh, what does that mean, treasury? Uh, went into the company coffers. Oh, God. <laughs> Different term. I haven't heard that one before. Very okay. good. Well, look, my re- my research team based off public filings, I mean, it, it looks like before this kind of stuff happened, about 38 million bucks has gone into the company. I mean, is that is that fairly accurate? Before GA? No, no, with GA and JMI, both those together, no, about 38 has no, no. gone in. No, no. Can- Canadian. Yeah. No, that was the JMI transaction in 2015. Oh, I see. Got it. Yeah. So it, and, it would have been, you know, GA was probably an, a, a nine figure investment. Got it. So the GA one was undisclosed. The JMI one was 38 back before that. Yes. Got it. Fair enough. That's great. So, the so help me. Of which was secondary back then as well. Yeah. So help me understand as a founder that's exited a couple companies, um, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of founders like you that listen to the show, you know, maybe had a 600, 500, 400, you know, million dollar exit in the past. How do you decide, you know, many people would say, well, listen, it's great. You have your own money, but you shouldn't risk it if you can help it. Right. You're backable now. So, so how did you really that battle in your head? I mean, how did you say, okay, now's the time to go 38 million from JMI versus keep using your own money and keep building? Well, I mean, uh, for one thing, we're a B corporation. So the, the goal in this was not necessarily, um, you know, just the rapacious pursuit of, of, of another exit and, and profit. We were really trying to scale this thing to, 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 uh, to make doing well by doing good more than a catchy tagline. So, so that did have some influence on the extent and of my willingness to use my own, my own funds. And, um, we had a very supportive angel network of oil and gas folks here in Calgary. And, and so we, we, uh, we really wanted to wait until the capital was something of a commodity and we could choose the right fit um, in terms of the private equity firm around culture and strategic value and some of those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, not sure if that answer, answers the question exactly. No, it does. I think it's fair. I do think uh, I do think B Corps are still kind of sexy and new. For those people that don't understand how they operate, can you give us a quick rundown? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the easiest way to think of it is that it's a for-profit business that has a social mission baked into its, its articles uh, of incorporation so that it's recognizing that as a stakeholder, if you will. And, and uh, I actually- Are there tax benefits to that? No, no, there's, there's, there's no real, I, I, I will besmirch the B Corp people, but there's no, there's no, <laughs> my hope is uh, at you're some lawyers, point, you're going to make your lawyers roll around here. <laughs> at some point, I hope the designation goes away because I believe that all companies can pursue hybrid goals like that without a special designation. Um, but uh, a lot of companies use it for marketing purposes and to, and to point out to the world that they have a, a sustainability or other sort of, um, uh, social driven a- agenda. Yep. And, and so how effective have you been at kind of installing this agenda across, again, these fortune 1000 brands and maybe said differently, you know, how many customers are you serving today? Yeah, we have about 450, uh, enterprise clients that the, the bulk of whom are, 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 are large, uh, companies. There's a few sort of mid market type companies in there and not all of them use all of our product suite. So, sure. so we interested in cross-selling and upselling and in some of the usual things. But we have, uh, you know, the metrics we, we track, obviously, in addition to the for-profit metrics and revenue and, and some of those uh, obvious ones, we track our social impact metrics. So we will distribute um, around $1.2 billion this year to a 
150,000 global charities. And that's the money that all the Microsofts and the Apples and everyone are kind of using you to put through to the local communities. Right. And their, and their people. So yeah. there's typically matching funds and, and donation currency incentives for volunteering, those sorts of things. Very cool. You're, you're going to hate the rest of these questions because I'm a total capitalist and I, I don't have the wisdom yet or the humbleness to be where you're at, but maybe one day, Brian, I'll get there. Um, help me in, uh, from, from, a, from a financial perspective. I mean, I can take that 450 times kind of the ACV target you had mentioned earlier of a hundred grand and that would put your you know, ARR right now at around 45 million bucks. That's just the SaaS revenue. Directionally, is that correct? Uh, directionally, it would be correct. It's, it's kind of obviously the average doesn't, doesn't work quite that way because we have some large clients that are very large and, and some smaller clients that are probably not there. So, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's, it's in the right direction. And, and based off the current kind of structure of the company, are you come and you sell fund, you do JMI, you do GA, now private equity is involved. What, what growth rate are you kind of seeing year over year in terms of your expansion? By the way, another thing I'm curious about is you could argue if you're turning away customers with less than 500 employees that this is actually a finite market. You can actually measure your market share. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're uh, our compound growth rate for the last five years is around 82%. This year we're, we're in the high forties to, to date. So, okay. so growing, still growing nicely. That's great. And, and again, how are you, how are you getting that growth and also being so selective with clients? Is it really expanding usage across the 450 or is it adding brand new logos altogether? Uh, it's mostly adding, adding new, new clients. But, oh, really? Uh, and the neat thing about this business as a business is, is not only do we add clients, but we can grow their programs and improve the participation rates and, and the, both the social outcomes. And, and, and more often than not, as we drive those, we're, we're also driving uh, revenue. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you're, you're turning away a lot of people. I'd love to understand kind of more about the engine that's attracting people to you. What does what your current team look like, Brian, total? And how many of them are marketing and sales? Uh, we have uh, about uh, five, 500 or so folks. Um, marketing and sales um, is still a lever that we are in, investing in. We, we, our sales team is only about 20, 21, I think, in the, in the, in the market. There's um, some supporting you know, solution engineers and BDRs and, and, and folks. Um, marketing team is, is not huge. The, the bulk of our people are dev you know, development, uh, engineering folks and, uh, client success, uh, people. So a lot of what is driving our growth is the trend in, in this area of moving away from CSR as a kind of a handout, sort of a, a okay. an approach to I one that's, on um, more about, engagement and the opportunity to connect people with their desire to, to have meaning. And employee and retention and happiness. Exactly. Yeah. No, we, totally have, get it. we actually have data now that's supporting the, the ROI around that in, in, through the use of our platform. You know, Brian, us millennials, it's avocado toast and Habitat for Humanity. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's true. We have, of those 500, I think 450 or 460 of them are millennials. So yeah. <laughs> we drink our own Kool-Aid. And I, I raise the average age um, in every room by 15 or 20 years when I walk in. That's good. They keep you young. Uh, of the 500, are they all, where are they all based? Uh, the bulk of them are in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, we have meaningful offices in Toronto uh, and uh, Victoria uh, in Canada. And a uh, small office in San Mateo, California, some salespeople scattered about the, the, the U.S., and then a, a small operation in the U.K. as well. That's great. Uh, last few questions here uh, as, as we wrap up. Um, walk me through uh, kind of how aggressive you're thinking about adding kind of new accounts, new customers. And, and the way to measure that, obviously, that I'd like to understand is uh, how, how, you know, your CAC, right? So if you're signing up a new $100,000 account, are you willing to spend first year ACV or more on getting those guys? Yeah, our, our, our CAC is extremely low. Um, so in fact, so much so that, 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 that uh, the private equity guys are, are uh, frightened that we're not spending nearly enough money. But how low are you um, talking? I mean, like one month payback kind of thing? Uh, probably in that, in that area. Um, 
it, it depends. You, you know, we have a lot of word of mouth referrals because we've serviced the heck out of um, these large companies and, and the service bar has been relatively low in, in that space. And the ability to, to um, uh, provide global capabilities has also been problematic. So, so we have both trends and sort of reputational thought leadership things helping helping with our growth. The constraint, frankly, is um, the configurability of our product because of these, you know, many of these companies um, think they're the most important company in the world and many of them, in fact, are. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so everything we build has to be configurable and yada, yada. And, and uh, it makes it very difficult to take that deployment model down market. Yep. And, and pretty sticky. What's churn rate look like over the past 12 months? Yeah, it's uh, in the 98% range. And 98% re- revenue retention? Oh, no. Revenue retention is is well north of 100. But well, net, retention- net revenue, sorry. Net revenue would be above 100. But gross revenue retention is 98? Yes. Uh, yeah. Call it 98, 97. Don't, don't, let, don't let me convince you what your numbers aren't. Is that, is that accurate? It's... Well, we, we don't we don't we don't measure gross revenue retention. Um, okay. We rever, we measure net revenue retention and client retention. So, our client retention rate is ninety eight percent. Our net revenue retention is one hundred and twenty ish. Yeah, and where is most of the expansion revenue coming from? Is it just the, the Microsoft's adding additional seeds because their teams are growing? Well, Microsoft it, Microsoft's a very big program, so that it doesn't necessarily grow as quickly as some of the other cohorts that don't have as mature a program. But um, most of the growth comes from, in in Microsoft's case, if they buy LinkedIn or something, that's adding a bunch of uh, employees. But many companies, it's it's program growth or enabling additional modules that they haven't um, enabled before. So. Yeah. Um, I would say, and then, and then a lot of the growth also comes from as the program grows, the donation volume typically grows and, and that drives platform revenue. Yep. Brian, very good. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your, uh, what was the last business book that you read? The last business book I read was a, a little book uh, called The Founder's Mentality uh, by a couple of Bain consulting people. Number um, no, you say that like it's a bad thing, but you're 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 part of them now. You're private equity, right? <laughs> well, I was reading it because it, it validates many of the things that I, I think are important as a company scales that we we don't necessarily want to do. Um, That's good. Number two, Brian, is there an under the radar CEO in Canada that you're following or studying? No. No, number, uh, that's okay. Number, uh, three, what billing system do you guys use? Billing system. We, we don't use an external billing system. You built an internal, well, I guess you said you've been around a while. You built an internal billing system. Well, we, we, we use adaptive and, uh, and intact as our, uh, systems. We're in the process of implementing work day next year, but, um, you know, we don't have a separate billing system. Okay. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I get seven to seven and a half. That's, that's pretty, very specific and great. And, uh, (laughs) what's your situation, Brian? Married, single kiddos? I am married with a couple of kiddos, one of whom is uh, just 10 years old. So for an old fart, I'm, I'm still, um, still in the game. You're still hip and cool. How many kids total? Pardon me? How many kids total? Two. Oh, Sorry. two. Okay. okay. Yeah. And Brian, how old are you? You said 50 what? I am 59. 59. Very good. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Um, that entrepreneurs are not necessarily born. They are also made. Guys, entrepreneurs are not born. They can also be made. Founded Benevity as a B Corp many, many years ago. Well, probably transitioned to B Corp, but back in 2008, now 500 uh, people, again, focused on helping big enterprise brands in, re- engage their employees and retain their employees by helping them figure out how they can give back, how they can volunteer. Currently, 450 customers. We're just talking about their SaaS revenue, which makes up about 50% of their revenue, but about 450 customers call it $100,000 ACV on average, but some smaller, some bigger call 
about 45 million bucks in AR, 47% year over year growth, which is obviously healthy, 98% logo retention annually, net revenue retention over 120%. Churn, uh, sorry, CAC, super, super low. A lot of their stuff is inbound uh, via their team based in Canada and other remote locations. Brian, thanks for taking us to the top. No, my pleasure. Continued success. Thank you, sir.